During the Second World War, Newfoundland and Labrador became a bustling center of military activity. Canada and America built military bases at places like Goose Bay, Argentia, Botwood, and St. John's. And they dispatched tens of thousands of troops to the small country. But when the war first broke out, no one knew that any of that would happen. So Newfoundland and Labrador's Commission of Government decided to establish its own Home Defense Force. The plan had already been years in the making. As tensions were escalating in Europe in the 1930s, global leaders braced for another world war. Officials in London urged all members of the British Empire to strengthen their defenses. That was a tall order for Newfoundland and Labrador. The committee observed that no plan of any sort exists for the active defense of Newfoundland and that the only armed forces consist of 255 constabulary and 50 rangers armed with obsolete and inefficient weapons who must be regarded as practically unarmed for the purposes of modern warfare. The Royal Newfoundland Regiment had fought during the First World War, but it disbanded in 1919. Since then, the country's struggling economy had prevented it from forming another military force. Simply put, in peacetime, defense spending seemed like a luxury that Newfoundland and Labrador could not afford. But priorities changed in 1939, and the Home Defense Force received a green light. Money problems persisted, though, and the Commission of Government could only afford a small force of about 200 men. Canada and Britain agreed to help out by sending equipment and personnel to train the force. In the meantime, St. John's Police Chief Patrick O'Neill stepped in to temporarily take charge of recruiting volunteers. The new force accepted men between the ages of 18 and 41 who were single or widowed and had no children. Enlistment was voluntary and it lasted until the end of the war. In mid-September, Captain Claude Fanning Evans of the British Army arrived in St. John's to relieve O'Neill. Training could now begin in earnest, but there was still a problem. The new force did not yet have a place where its men could live. Until permanent barracks were secured, enlistment would have to be confined to St. John's and surrounding areas. Only recruits who could live in their own homes and report for training each morning could enroll. The situation improved in November when the force found temporary barracks at the King George V Siemens Institute. About a month later, the men moved into the West and East End Fire Halls in St. John's. Enlistment could finally proceed at full speed and include applicants from across the country. There were other changes, too. At the end of October, the Home Defense Force was officially renamed the Newfoundland Militia. And it was put under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Walter Rendell. He was a veteran of the First World War and one of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment's famous first 500 recruits. By mid-December, 55 men were training in two squads. City residents enjoyed watching them march through town. They usually started at the Newfoundland Constabulary's parade grounds at Fort Townsend and marched to an area on the outskirts of town known as the Sand Pits. Today, that land is home to the Health Sciences Center, but during the Second World War, it was the Newfoundland Militia's outdoor firing range. From 11 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, recruits learned how to use rifles and bayonets and machine guns. While the new recruits were training, it was the Newfoundland Constabulary's job to guard the country against enemy attack. The Newfoundland Militia began to gradually take over these duties in the late fall of 1939. At first, teams of constables and militiamen worked together to protect strategic locations. This continued until the spring of 1940, when the Newfoundland Militia had trained enough men to completely take over guard duties from the constabulary. Militia men were now responsible for guarding the St. John's Dry Docks, the Windsor Lake water supply, 
the transatlantic cables at Cuckold's Cove, radio transmitters in Mount Pearl, and the Imperial Oil Company's storage tanks on the south side of the St. John's Harbor. They also guarded an internment camp at Kitty Vitty Lake in St. John's. The camp held German and Italian internees who had been taken from ships that were already in local ports when the war broke out. As hostilities progressed, internees also came from enemy ships captured at sea. The camp was closed in 1941 to make way for a new American military base. All prisoners were sent to Canadian internment camps. Members of the Newfoundland militia also guarded the iron ore mines at Bell Island. The mines were important to Canada's armed forces because Canada used Bell Island ore to make weapons and equipment. With permission from the Commission of Government, Canada also installed two 4.7-inch guns and two searchlights on Bell Island to protect the loading piers from enemy attack. The militiamen operated the guns and searchlights, but they first had to complete three months of training with the Royal Canadian Artillery in Halifax. These men formed a special unit within the Newfoundland militia known as the 1st Coastal Defence Battery. That same summer, the militia decided to more than double its numbers from 200 to 500 men. It expanded its recruiting program and moved into larger barracks at Shamrock Field in St. John's. The field was donated to the Newfoundland militia by the Order of the Christian Brothers. Detachments of Newfoundland militiamen were also assigned to other areas on the island. The men guarded the fluorospar mines at St. Lawrence, the Canadian ammunition dump at Whitburn, and the cable stations at Bay Roberts and Harbour Grace. Even more change came in 1941 when Lieutenant Colonel Alfred Howell assumed command of the Newfoundland militia. One of his goals was to let militiamen apply for overseas service with Britain's Royal Artillery. Two of its regiments were already composed of recruits from Newfoundland and Labrador, the 59th Heavy Regiment and the 166th Field Artillery Regiment. Militiamen could join one of these two units after they successfully completed a 12-week training program. By the end of the war, the Newfoundland militia had sent 800 men overseas. That wasn't the only change Howell spearheaded. Under his watch, the Newfoundland militia was officially renamed the Newfoundland Regiment in 1943. From its humble beginnings as a home defense force of about 30 recruits in the fall of 1939, the unit had grown into a full regiment, complete with a headquarters, an infantry battalion, and a coastal defense battery on Bell Island. By the end of the war, the regiment had enlisted 1,668 recruits. It sent 820 men overseas. 30 men died in service, 8 of natural causes and 22 in a fire that destroyed the Knights of Columbus Hostel in St. John's on December 12, 1942. Shortly after Germany surrendered on May 8, 1945, the Newfoundland Regiment began to discharge its men. The final soldiers left Shamrock Field on July 15, 1946. The Newfoundland Regiment wasn't the only local defense force on the island. Home Guard units also formed in the paper towns of Grand Falls and Corner Brook during the war. Mill operators in both towns were worried that Germans might try to sabotage the local pulp and paper industry. As a result, the Commission of Government passed the Auxiliary Militia Act in 1940. It allowed for the formation of voluntary, unpaid, part-time militia units in Grand Falls and Corner Brook. The first Home Guard company formed at Grand Falls in the fall of 1940. It had about 160 members. Two years later, the Bay of Islands Home Guard formed in Corner Brook. The Newfoundland Regiment commanded the Home Guards, and the Canadian Army helped to train recruits. Both Home Guard units were renamed the Newfoundland Militia in March 1943 after the original Newfoundland Militia became the Newfoundland Regiment. 
A third home defense force was the Air Raid Precautions Organization. The ARP recruited about 1,000 volunteers and trained them in emergency response, first aid, and firefighting. They also learned how to put out firebombs. The main arm of the ARP was based in St. John's. Aside from protecting the city from enemy attack, it also enforced blackouts in St. John's. Each night, volunteers scoured the city, checking windows, doorways, streets, and wharves for lighting that might be visible to enemy ships and aircraft. Sometimes, citizens were tested with surprise blackouts. Entirely without warning, the air raid sirens in St. John's began to shriek their alarm at 10.30 p.m. on Wednesday night last, sending residents to shelter and plunging the city into almost total darkness. The alarm period was continued for a half hour and the all clear signal was given at 11 p.m. Branches sprang up outside of St. John's too, including one at Deer Lake. Regarding what we can do in Deer Lake and vicinity if a hostile aeroplane came over, the question arises, can we be prepared? There is no reason why we should not. It is possible that a hostile airplane may never come over. But it must be remembered that in several parts of the world where it was thought that it can't happen here eventually proved to be wrong. Although the ARP was never called upon to defend Newfoundland and Labrador from a major attack, its blackout duties contributed to local defense. And so did the duties of all the other home defense forces that served during the Second World War.